I arrived to find that he'd turned his bedroom into a mini-theater, complete with scented candles and glistening fairy lights. He handed me a bowl of popcorn, and as we nibbled our way to the bottom, a carefully written letter came into sight that said, I've been in love with you ever since we were little kids. I've held back my feelings as I didn't want to ruin our friendship, but I can't deny them any longer. So, will you be my girlfriend? Ah, uh, how can he be so gorgeous and sweet and... <sighs> hey, dummy, you writing that cheesy stuff again? Just drop it already. Let's go prank Mr. Weasley. Okay, I'm coming. Hmm, if only what I wrote came to life. That's my best friend since childhood, Adrian. And as you can see, I have the biggest crush on him. But he only sees me as a bro. How ironic. I'm pretty sure if I confessed my feelings to him, he'd weird it out saying it's gross and stuff. So I just wrote my dream reality down in my novel and posted it on Wattpad. I even used a pen name. I couldn't risk Adrian finding out, because, help, awkward alert. Anyway, it's easier this way, as I didn't want my parents to find out either. Yep, they weren't exactly supportive of my writing career. They wanted me to become a lawyer and take over the family firm just like my dad, and his dad, and blah, blah, blah. They made me study hard so I'd get into this prestigious law school, but it was just so dull and my heart just wasn't into it. One day, as I was sipping a macchiato at my favorite coffee shop, a group of girls walked in chattering excitedly about a book by the new author, Agatha C. Huh? Did I hear them right? Curious, I approached them and politely asked to see the book and... Oh. My God. It was my pen name right on the cover. I scanned through the first few pages and saw my words. Did this mean... My book was published? Ouch! <laughs> so all this was real! So, someone must have given my book to the publisher. Then it's gotta be Mrs. Jensen. Yes! She is the most respected writer and has loads of connections in the publishing industry. And lucky me, she was my mentor. Hi, Mrs. Jensen! I'm just calling to say I'm so grateful for what you've done for me. Cecilia, calm down! What are you talking about? The book, of course. Mrs. Jensen, my book got published thanks to you. Right? You're talking nonsense, young lady. I've barely started reading your book. So how could it have been published without my notice? What? So, Mrs. Jensen didn't send it. Then, who did? What do you mean you can't disclose their identity? It's my book! Miss, all I can say is that the person who brought it here claims to be the author of the book and chose not to reveal themselves by publishing it under a pen name. We, as the publisher, are legally bound by that, so I can't help you any further. What on earth was he talking about? Some random person stole my book and my pen name? I needed to prove they were both mine. Hmm. Aha! My Wattpad page! I tried to log into my account to show the director, but... Access denied? Oh, no, no, no. Someone must have messed with it. I was gonna use it to apply for a writing scholarship at college, and now it was all gone. As if that wasn't bad enough. I suddenly received an email from the writing competition I'd applied for, saying they denied my entry due to plagiarism of a Wattpad page. My Wattpad page! Ugh! So, bro, what's with the King Kong face? <laughs> oh, come on. You'll be less of an ugly duggling if you smile more. See? My gosh, could he just stop being like that for once? He made it very clear we had zero chance of being together. I got it, but he didn't have to rub it in my face like that. Fine then, he'd never have to see me again. After that, I was determined to transfer to another school by the next semester. One that would appreciate my writing talent. Somewhere like... Eastwood Academy, it's a school full of literature records. Besides, I happen to know someone there. Lewis, the president of the Literature Club, and also an uprising star in the writer world. He's not only super talented, but incredibly nice too. He'd help me loads with my novels. But getting into that school would be tough. So every day, with my game face on, I buried my head under stacks of books, 
while Adrian tried his best to distract me. One time, he told me to ditch class and go see the new Batman movie with him. I'd waited months for that movie. But no, I'd got to get my head in the game. Adrian didn't give up that easily, though. Only, right at that moment, the teacher appeared behind his back, yanked his ears, and gave him a ticket to the detention room. There went the Batman movie for him. <laughs> Another time, he came up with a prank for Mr. Jones, the P.E. teacher who made him run ten laps around the school for being late. But, sorry, the new Cecilia ain't got time for any of his childish stuff. So when Adrian gave me Mr. Jones's phone and told me to hide it away, I just calmly handed it back to him. As Mr. Jones returned to the teacher lounge, he saw Adrian pouring some liquid into his tumbler, and that's how Adrian got himself two detention tickets. <laughs> After that, Adrian finally noticed that I had been acting differently. Cece, what is up with you? You keep ignoring me. Are we not friends anymore? Don't call me Cece. I'm still mad at you, okay? So, yeah, I want to transfer to Eastwood Academy. You know, Lewis's school. Oh, I see. Stop the act. I know it already. What? Did he know that I like him? Had he read my book? You like Lewis. Huh? Oh. Phew. But hang on. He really thought that? And was he annoyed? Hmm. Interesting. Yep. In fact, he asked me out to dinner this Saturday. Really? Okay, then. I'll go with you. Can't trust this guy. And so Adrian tagged along. He kept complaining about how I dressed up all pretty for Lewis, and how he had the nerve to be late. So this is what he's like when he's jealous? Kinda cute, though. As Lewis arrived, he gave me a big hug, and I could feel Adrian's glare behind my back. <laughs> I sat close to Lewis and giggled at everything he said. He immediately got what I was trying to do, so he acted along, putting his arm around my shoulder and slightly stroking my hair. At one point, I even helped Lewis take a fallen eyelash out. And oh boy, Adrian couldn't help but lunge forward to separate us. Right at that moment, I heard a familiar voice from behind. Cecilia? And who are these young men? Lewis? Oh, hi Mrs. Jensen. What a small world. You know Lewis too? She didn't answer my question. Instead, she gave me a stern look, then dragged me outside. Cecilia, what are you doing with that no-good traitor? You mean, Lewis? Who else? He was heavily criticized and boycotted by the whole writer's community. I strongly suggest you give him a wide berth. Oh my. I had no idea Lewis had such a bad reputation. He was always so kind to me. Unless this was just an act because he wanted something. Like my novel. What if he was the one who stole it? This was not good. I rushed back to my table, quickly said goodbye to Adrian, then dragged Lewis away. Did you or did you not steal my book? What? No. Did Mrs. Jensen tell you that? Turns out, he used to be Mrs. Jensen's brightest mentee. Then he fell in love with her daughter Demi, and they started dating behind her back. But then out of the blue, Demi suddenly broke up with him. Heartbroken, he cut all ties with her and her mom. But Mrs. Jensen took offense at this and had been on his back ever since. Gosh, now my head was spinning. I had no idea who to trust. Come to think of it, back in my menti months, I also lost one of my manuscripts. I sort of ran into a dead end with that one, so I didn't do any digging, but it can't be a coincidence, right? It must have been Mrs. Jensen who stole them. No way! She's an incredible writer. Why would she do something like that? There's no better explanation for this. Don't worry, I've got a plan to expose her for the stinking thief she is. He then called the publisher, pretending to be some big-shot producer, and asked them to arrange a meeting with the author of my stolen book, as he'd like to produce a high-budget movie based on it. Brilliant, isn't it? We arrived at the rendezvous in awesome disguises and waited for this to play out. Her tension rose as the footsteps got closer, and then standing at the door was, well... Mrs. Jensen! How could you? I trusted you! Cecilia? What's going on? Oh, drop the act. There's no movie. We only planned this trap to expose you for the book thief you are. Mrs. Jensen persistently denied our accusations, 
and claimed she was only here because her daughter arranged a big surprise for her. Then Lewis and Mrs. Jensen started quarreling with each other, and it all got messy. Stop! Both of you, please just stop! Demi, please explain yourself. I... it was me, okay? I stole your book, Cecilia. I saw it on Mom's desk. I'm so sorry. I don't understand. You don't need to steal someone else's hard work. You already are an excellent writer. No, Mom, I'm not. I've tried so hard to meet your expectations, but I just can't. I didn't want to disappoint you, so I stole your mentee's work. Including yours, Louis. I was so ashamed of myself I couldn't face you after that. I'm so, so sorry. Louis let out a long sigh, then pulled Demi in for a hug and comforted her. Right at that moment, Adrian barged in and grabbed Louis's collar. You jerk! You were flirting with Cecilia a day ago, and now you're canoodling with another girl right in front of her? Adrian, stop! It's not what you think! Then I led him out of the restaurant. Turns out, he saw me leaving the house with Louis looking all weird, so he decided to follow us here. Um, the truth is, I don't have a crush on Louis. I was just trying to see if you think of me as more than just a friend. Um, well, I do like you. Like, a lot. But I don't want to risk our friendship. I can't bear the thought of not having you in my life, so I figured it'd be best to treat you as one of the guys. Guess what? I like you too, idiot. So, what do you say? Yeah, let's give it a shot. But you have to promise me if things don't work out, we'll still be friends, okay? Promise. Then we pinky swore, just like when we were little kids. Only this time, he pulled me in for the best kiss ever. Finally, my book's mine again. And guess what? It has just become the number one bestseller novel according to the New York Times. Ah! This calls for a celebration. Adrian, will you help me with the guest list for the party? Sure, sweetie. Who do you want to invite? Now, let's see. There's my parents, who were so impressed with my independent work that they're now letting me follow my writing dreams. There's also Louis and Demi. Aw, they make such a cute couple. Demi decided to start over with her writing career, this time without the pressure from her mom. And with Louis's help, she's got a bright future ahead. And last but not least, Mrs. Jensen, who's now fully supportive of her daughter's career and her relationship with Louis. Huh, <laughs> I guess it's a happy ending for both my novel, me. Hi, my name is Happiness. You're impressed with my name, right? My dad gave me that name. And yeah, as you can guess, he put a lot of hopes and dreams in me. I'm now 18 years old, and tomorrow I will fly to Massachusetts to start my college. My parents are preparing a farewell party for me downstairs. I have never left my hometown and been away from my family, so this is such an occasion. As I'm packing my belongings for college, a flood of memories come to mind. You see, when I was a kid, my family was dirt poor. We lived in an old, dilapidated house on the outskirts of Selma in Alabama. I remember we would buy a chicken at the beginning of the month, and my parents would make it last the whole month. I didn't realize we were poor, though. In fact, at that point, I was just a happy, carefree little girl, but that wouldn't last. My mom worked as a cleaner for a rich family, but they treated her terribly, and she barely earned enough money to even take the bus there. My dad was a lorry driver, and so he was away a lot, delivering goods to other states. Every weekend when he came home, I'd stand out on the porch as soon as I saw his big truck driving up the dusty road. I'd run out there and jump up and down. The best part was that he always brought me a little present, like a piece of candy that he'd save for me, or a small toy. They weren't valuable gifts, but they meant the world to me. One time he came home, and I ran up to him and said, Daddy, yesterday Jeannie's dad brought her a chocolate egg back from his trip. It even had a toy inside. I want one too. My dad looked confused. Then he said he'd heard of them, and they were called Kinder Eggs. And then, with loving eyes and a smile, he promised he'd find me one, no matter how hard it would be, even if it was the last thing he did. The next weekend, I raced out to the street and could barely contain my excitement as I waited for him to come home. I waited and waited but still he didn't arrive. 
I started to get worried, so I asked my mom where he was. She said, oh, sweetie, he's on his way. Why don't you go to sleep, and as soon as you wake up, he'll be here. There was no way I could sleep. All I could think about was getting a chocolate egg with a toy inside. I'd almost dozed off when I heard his voice. I ran downstairs and jumped into his arms, hugging him. I missed you, Daddy, I told him, and he laughed and said, I missed you too, sweetie pie. Then I said, um, where is it? Did you get me a chocolate egg? I eagerly asked. Then his face dropped. He said, sorry, baby, I was working late, so I didn't have time to buy one, but I promise I'll bring you two next time to make up for it, okay? But this wasn't okay. I was so disappointed. I pushed him away from me and burst into tears, saying, You promised! You promised me! I'd never cried like that before over something so small, but at the time it felt like such a big deal, and my dad looked confused to see me so upset. At that moment, my mom came through and saw me. She immediately understood everything, then started to comfort my dad. Come on, honey, take a rest. You've worked yourself too hard recently. Come eat. You're so skinny these days. This just made me more annoyed. I was the one who needed comforting, not my dad. So I shouted at my mom, Mommy, daddy didn't keep his promise. But my mom just ignored me. And so I stormed back up the stairs, crying all the way. After I'd calmed down, my mom came to my room and said, Happiness, your dad works so hard and you should just be happy that he's home safely. I know he didn't bring you what you wanted, but he will next time, okay? In the meantime, I'll make your favorite cupcakes every day. Every day? Wow, okay, I said to her. And she really did. She made me cupcakes every day, and I was so happy. After a few days, I said to her, Mommy, I like you more than Daddy. I don't even love him anymore because he broke his promise. My mom just looked at me and said, Oh, happiness, you don't know what you're saying. One day when you grow up, you'll understand that everything your dad does is for you. He loves you so much. The next weekend rolled around, and as usual, I ran outside to wait for my dad. Just like the week before, the sun set and still he was nowhere to be seen. I was about to start crying when I noticed a man running towards our front door. My mom appeared and he said something, and suddenly my mom started panicking. She called out to me and said we had to go to Grandpa's place immediately. I had no idea what was happening, but for the next month, my grandpa took care of me because my parents didn't come home. I missed them so much, and whenever I asked when they were coming to get me, my grandpa just said, Happiness, they're busy working. Don't you worry. Just stay here and enjoy your time with me. Eventually, I got used to it. Then one morning, grandpa woke me up early and said it was time to go home. I was so excited that I kept on singing happily. As we pulled up outside our house, my heart started beating faster. I was home. Then a shadow appeared in the doorway, and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was my mom and dad, but my dad was in a wheelchair. My mom looked so thin and tired, and my dad had no legs. What had happened? I looked to Grandpa to reassure me, but he looked as nervous as I did. Then in my little voice, I said, Daddy? Where are your legs? He smiled at me and with his usual loving eye said, They got hurt. But hey, what do you think of my wheelchair? He let me sit on his lap and mom pushed us around and it was so cool. I was way too young to understand what was really going on. All I remember was how many people kept visiting to check on dad and that I finally got to try a chocolate egg. That same day, a doctor came to visit and after he checked on my dad, he came over and patted my head. Then he pulled a chocolate egg out of his bag. And then another one. And another one. Three chocolate eggs. I couldn't believe it. I was shaking with excitement. The doctor said the gift was from my dad and that I should thank him. I ran to my dad and said, thank you, daddy. He looked like he was going to cry. And I asked if he was okay. And he just smiled and said, I'm happy because you're happy. That's all that matters to me. For the first time in my life, I got to try a chocolate egg, and it was the most delicious thing I'd ever tasted. And the best part was that inside there was a toy. After I opened and ate all three, I just wanted more. I kept asking my dad when I could get more, and he just laughed. And then I thought, maybe if I studied really hard and was a good girl, I'd get some more. 
So that's what I did. I focused on my study. And one day I won a medal at school for winning a math contest. I was so excited to show my parents and assumed they'd give me a chocolate egg as a reward. But that's not what happened. They congratulated me, but said it wasn't possible for them to get me another chocolate egg. I don't know why, but this made me so angry. I cried and I even threw my bag at them. And this made my mom super mad. She scolded me so much that I was scared and ran out the house and went to my grandpa's house. I cried and cried and told him everything. And my grandpa said, Happiness, the reason your mom got so mad is because she is under too much pressure and has to work so hard to look after you. Now, your dad can't work, so she's in charge. And it's a lot for her to deal with. Then he told me what happened to my dad and it changed my life forever. That day when my dad was out doing his deliveries, he got an opportunity to do some overtime, which he jumped at the chance to do so he could buy me my chocolate eggs. On his way home, he stopped to buy them for me, and then because he was so tired, as he was leaving the store, he got hit by a drunk driver. He was hit so hard he lost both his legs. I couldn't believe it. How could I have been so selfish? If it weren't for me demanding a chocolate egg, my dad would still have his legs. I felt so terrible. And so the next day, when I won some candy for the other math contests, I came home and went to my parents. Mommy, Daddy, I'm so sorry. I want you to have these. You always do your best to give me the sweetest life, and so I wanted to make yours sweeter too. That probably sounds a bit deep for a six-year-old to say, right? Well, my grandpa taught me that one. My parents were so moved. But they almost cried when they hugged me. And even though I didn't understand it at the time, I do now. And it's so true. It's taken me a while. But now that I'm about to move out, I finally understand the life my parents have given me and how sweet it has been. Through this channel, I'd like to send some words to my parents. Mom, Dad, if you're watching this, I want you to know how much I appreciate everything you've done for me. Now it's my turn to work hard and make you proud. No matter how hard life gets, I'll persevere, just like you both have, because I'm your happiness. I was born into a pretty poor family, so money was always on my mind. As I grew up, all I wanted was to have money, and I couldn't wait until I was old enough to start making some of my own. I especially couldn't stand the way people took advantage of others, just to get some quick cash. And yet, it wasn't long before I almost became like one of those gold diggers that I hated so much. I'm Jolie, and I'm 20 years old. You might be wondering why I hate gold diggers? Well, who doesn't? But for starters, my mom was one. Yup. That's right. She ditched me and my dad to marry some rich guy when I was just five years old. I can't even recall her face, but I still remember that day like it was just yesterday. I was screaming and crying and begging her not to leave, but she didn't even look back. Ever since, it's just been me and my dad. Obviously, my dad worked really hard to make enough money to raise me alone, but we were still poor. He worked on construction sites, and the hours were long, so it wasn't long before his health started to go downhill. A lot of his money went towards medical bills, and so we made do with whatever was left. This made me hate my mama so much. She was the most selfish person in the world to me. Dad still encouraged me to focus on my education, though, so I ended up going to college to further study Chinese, which I've always been fond for. But after one year... We couldn't afford it anymore, so I decided to quit and find a job to help my dad out. At first, I worked as a waitress, but I was pretty smart, and my Chinese was good, so eventually, I got another job as an interpreter in a big company, where I met John. He was the CEO, and also the person who would change my entire life. So there I was working two jobs, and even though I was exhausted, I was happy. I was making enough money to look after my dad, and also had enough left to buy gifts for my boyfriend. Yep, that's right. I had a boyfriend called Scott, and we'd been dating for two years. I felt like the luckiest girl in the world. 
because he was drop-dead gorgeous. I loved buying him stuff because it made him so happy. Finally, my life was turning around for the better. But then everything changed in the blink of an eye. I caught Scott cheating on me with some woman the same age as his mom. I couldn't believe it. He used his good looks to date older women just so he could get their money. He was as bad as my mom. Nothing but a gold digger. Though little did I know, I was about to follow in their footsteps. It all started the day I caught him cheating. I was so upset and miserable. I'd bumped into them in the mall where I'd seen them holding hands and kissing, and all I wanted was to get as far away as possible from there. I ran out onto the street, and then I just collapsed onto the sidewalk and started crying my eyes out. Suddenly, I heard someone say, Jolie, what are you doing here? I looked up, and John, the CEO, was standing there. I tried to stop the tears, but I couldn't. I couldn't even speak. He helped me up and told me to get in the car and go somewhere so I could calm myself down. Then we ended up in a bar, and I drank a lot. I couldn't stop myself from telling him about what Scott had done. John comforted me, and then, the next moment, I woke up, and John was lying next to me. I was about to freak out, but John looked at me and smiled, and said that if I hung out with him from time to time, like this, then he'd subsidize everything for me, so that I could go back to college and pay my tuition. I was shocked. He said it had to be our secret, so that his wife didn't find out. I was about to say no way! but the thought of being able to finish my studies and graduate made me consider it again. And after all, John was being so sweet, and me and my dad could really use that extra money. So the next moment, I found myself nodding my head, and the rest was history. I had officially become John's secret lover, aka a gold digger. And let me tell you, my life got so much easier. I went back to college and had more time to enjoy life. But at the same time, I couldn't shake off the guilt, especially when I thought about John's wife. I'd never met her before, but I knew from working at John's company that her name was Doris, and that she was the perfect wife. I even found out that they didn't have kids because Doris was infertile, after some accident. This made me feel so bad. How had I let myself become a mistress like this? It wasn't right. But still, I couldn't just end things with John. You see, I'd actually started to fall in love with him. Yes, you can say I was a gold digger, but I also had real feelings for him. And so did he. He took care of me, and I was happy with him. It was only natural that I'd start loving him. And so, even though I knew what we were doing was wrong, I couldn't stop it. Then one day, I was walking to the bus stop when a random man approached me and said that Doris wanted to meet me. Oh... My god, Doris knew about me? I felt so sick suddenly. He said she wanted to meet me right away, and so I followed him to a nearby cafe where she was waiting. As soon as I saw her, my jaw dropped. I knew her. It was the woman Scott had cheated on me with. No way! I couldn't believe my eyes! When she saw me, she looked shocked. But then she said, Well, well, well. Looks like we're destined to meet. Okay, I'll get straight to the point. You need to back away from my husband. What? Clearly, Doris wasn't the perfect wife everyone made her out to be. I said to her, You do know you're no better than me, right? I wonder what John would say if he knew you were having an affair too. She was furious. She started shouting at me, saying John would never leave her, and that she would not let me steal him away especially his money, and that it all belonged to her. Then she stormed off. Surprise, surprise, she was just with John for his money. She was even worse than me. At least I loved him. After that meeting, the war between Doris and I officially began. She started to rub in my face that she was his wife, and I wasn't. Every day, she'd turn up at the office with his lunch and kiss him in front of me. Honestly, it made me sick. No, really. Like, literally sick. But no luck for her, the universe works in funny ways. And guess what? I was pregnant. 
and this was one thing I could give John that Doris couldn't. I was so happy. I called John right away. He was over the moon and promised to take care of me and the kid. He started spending more time with me after that, but one day when we were together, Doris called and said she was sick. I couldn't stand her interrupting our special time like this, so I pretended to have stomach pains, and he immediately drove me to the hospital and asked their maid to go take care of Doris. Ha! Huh, I'd won this time. But then something shocking happened. Doris appeared in front of my house. When would she give up? I walked towards her and asked, What else do you want now? She was about to say something, but suddenly, my dad came out from the house and said, Jolie, what are you doing? So both me and Doris turned back and, well, that's when things got crazier. Doris? My dad shouted in surprise. He looked like he'd seen a ghost. Then Doris said, Thomas? How did they know each other? Well, the next thing, my dad was screaming. Get away from her. She's not your daughter anymore. I froze. Doris was... My mom? Before I could even say anything, she ran to her car and drove off. I didn't even want to see my dad. I just wanted to be alone. That night, I lay awake all night thinking about it all. I'd been competing with my mom? This was so wrong. What was I going to do? I loved John, and I wanted to have his baby so badly. But he was my mom's husband. And then, all those old feelings of abandonment came flooding back. My mom had left us, and now she was hurting John. She just took advantage of our love and only cared about money. She didn't care about any of us. Why could she be so selfish? I couldn't stop crying. Everything was such a mess. Eventually, I fell asleep, and when I woke up, I knew what I had to do. Even though she was my mom, she needed to learn a lesson once and for all. I called John and asked if we could meet at our favorite cafe. I was so nervous, but I told him everything. How she cheated on him, and then how she was my mom. I even showed him some photos of her with Scott that I'd taken outside Scott's house. John was so shocked, he just stared at me, not saying anything. He looked completely heartbroken and I wanted to hug and comfort him, but I knew I couldn't do that anymore. In the end, John divorced Doris and kicked her out of the house, leaving her with nothing. And then, you won't believe it, he proposed to me. What did I say? Well, I'm still deciding. Becoming the wife of my mom's ex-husband just feels a bit strange. My mom has suffered a lot already. I'm not sure I want to make her even more miserable. But... Let's see. All I know is that I'm going to give birth soon and raise this baby in the best way I can. I'm definitely going to be a better mom than my mom was. That's for sure. Hey, it's me, Erin again. I'm here to tell you the concluding part of my story. So, I came up with a genius idea to swap boyfriends with my bestie, Jace, and mess things up to make our current boyfriends appreciate us more. Only, my plan backfired massively when my boyfriend Zach decided he loved Jace, not me. Standing on Zach's doorstep having him tell me he didn't love me anymore was so humiliating, especially as a bunch of college kids were hanging out nearby and could hear everything. I yelled at him. We've been together for three years. Doesn't that mean anything to you? He replied, I know. And we've had some great times together, but we've grown apart. Besides, I know Jace loves me too. Geez, Zach. She doesn't. It was all part of the plan. Nah, before all that, she told me she was tired of Jay, and she really loves me. But she couldn't do that to you, or to Jay. What? Unbelievable! I made this plan work for her, but all along, she'd been playing me and my boyfriend. She'd ruined my relationship behind my back and been fake to me all this time? 
Now she was playing happily ever after with Jay while my boyfriend was pining after her. I stormed out of there, but going home was the last place I wanted to be, so I ended up at the park. I sat there, thinking things through. I couldn't just leave things like this. Both Zack and Jay needed to know about Jace's true face. Fueled by my anger and humiliation, I rushed off to find Jay. Then I told him everything. He looked completely shocked as I told him how the plan backfired, as now Jace has feelings for Zack and was just using him. I expected him to get upset or something, but instead, he just looked angry and shouted at me. Erin, you're such a bad friend. I've always loved Jace, and I know she loves me too. Stop trying to wreck other people's happiness because your own love life sucks. I stood there speechless, then watched as he walked off. O-M-G. That did not go as expected. Is that all people thought of me? That I was some bitter, jealous jerk? All I tried to do was save Jason Jay's relationship. And it worked, didn't it? But now, I didn't know what was going on anymore. Sighing, I realized that I was wrong to confront Jay without talking to Jace first. For all I knew, Zack could have been lying. I mean, the guy was completely delusional. It just hurt so much that he didn't love me anymore. Instead, he loved my best friend. As much as this sucked, I knew I was wrong to blame Jace for this before hearing her out. Maybe Jay was right. I was a bad friend. I wanted to find Jace, but Jay must have got to her first, as she was never in our room anymore. Then, a friend of ours told me Jace had moved back home. OMG, she'd moved out and not even told me. I tried catching up with her after classes, but she avoided me at all costs. Ugh, this sucked. I'd had enough of this. So one day, I stopped her at the classroom door and said, We need to talk. She tried to walk away, so I grabbed her arm. But she replied, There's nothing to talk about. How could she act so flippant when she had everything and I was left with nothing? So I shouted at her, Excuse me, you ruined our plan? Now you have everything. You have your boyfriend back, and my boyfriend wants you, not me. Not only do they both now hate me, but you moved out without even telling me. Like an ending for our friendship? I know I didn't handle things that well, and I'm sorry for that. But I was hurting, Jace. And you, you've been the worst. So stop being so selfish and fix it up. Everyone was gawping at us, and Jace started blushing. Then she hissed at me. Let's talk about it later. Not here. This only made me angrier, as I knew she had absolutely no intention of actually talking to me. Raging, I yanked back her ponytail. She yelped out, What are you doing? Get off! Then who should appear but Zack? Ugh! He pulled me off her, then hugged her. Then he shouted at me, When will you grow up and think about your words and behavior? I was shocked. Now he was on her side. Jeez. This guy had ditched me for my best friend. What was he expecting from me? Sunshine and unicorns? Suddenly, Jay appeared and saw Zack hugging Jace. Shocked, he said. What's going on here? Jace, is this real? You and him? So what Aaron said was true all along? Jace moved away from Zack and said, Jay... I'm sorry. It wasn't meant to be like this. He gave a nod of his head, then replied, I trusted you, but it seems like it's not worth it. After that, he left. Jace looked really confused and embarrassed, which, I'm not gonna lie, made me feel a little bit satisfied. Also, Zack was not a fool and got angry about how she'd moved away from him. I left them to their heated discussion and went into class. Good. Now her love life was a mess, and it was my turn to fix mine. I had to bring Zack back to me on my own. No one could help me now. So one day, at his basketball match with another school's team, I asked the cheerleader team to let me in the rooster mascot suit. It was so stuffy in there, but it'd be worth it, right?
I would surprise him by running to hug him and celebrate when the team wins. He would definitely be touched and see that I'm always by his side cheering and watching him. So as planned, I ran down to embrace Zach as he scored the winning shot for the team. I tried to kiss him, but I forgot that I was in the form of a rooster. This made all the audience laugh. Zach tried to run away, but I chased after him and I stumbled. The rooster head fell off and everyone saw me. This time, the laughter and screams were even louder, but I just saw Zach looking at me with embarrassed and disappointed eyes. Talk about humiliating. Worse still, he didn't even help me up, just shook his head, then walked off. At that moment, I just wanted to melt into the ground, but then Jay rushed over and helped me to my feet. Jay drove me home, and he said, Why did you have to embarrass yourself like that? And for a person who doesn't deserve you? I replied, He's my boyfriend. He isn't anymore. I know it hurts like crazy, Aaron. But sometimes, we need to let go of things that no longer belong to us. Don't lose your self-worth for unworthy things. I looked up at him with teary eyes. So, you don't want Jace back? Nah. She's made it pretty clear that she wants him. Not me. And I'm not going to be second best to anyone. Besides, she lied to me. And I'm not about that. I guess you're right. I sighed. It just hurts so much. Aaron, you're a strong girl. You'll get through this. But please promise me one thing, though. No more crazy ideas to try and win him back. I know. I know. I managed a laugh. When I got home, I thought about what Jay said. I guess he had a point. No matter how hard I tried to pull Zack back, he still turned away from me. And the same with Jace. I tried to fix things with her, and only ended up making everything worse. Thinking about it, Zack wasn't right for me. He wanted me to change who I was just to fit in with his life better. That wasn't right. I wanted a boyfriend who was proud of being seen with me, not embarrassed. And for Jace, she'd lied to me and then she hadn't even respected me enough to talk to me before moving out. She wasn't a true friend. I knew that now. As the weeks passed, I finally got over everything. About Jace and Zach, I still see them around campus, but we don't talk. I heard they are a couple now, but the boys in the basketball club don't like her very much because she never lets Zach go out after matches with them. She also never dances and cheers happily for their victory. Well. That's not my problem now anyway. Ha! Huh. As for Jay and I, we're getting closer. I guess we bonded over our broken hearts. Also, it turns out, we're far more similar than we realized. We started to hang out more, and then yesterday I suggested that we should go to the amusement park. His face was serious for a second, but then we both burst into laughter. I apologized to him for being ridiculous before, and he said, Never mind. I love your positive vibes. I smiled happily and said, Don't worry. This time I won't distract you while you're trying to win me a teddy. Then we both laughed. We're not officially a couple yet, but I can feel something between us. But there's no rush. I'm living in the moment, and it's pretty darn great. And now, if you'll excuse me, I have an amusement park to get to. Hey, Kat here. I don't want to alarm you or anything, but this is the final part of my story. I hope you'll enjoy it. And here's a reminder of what's happened in the last part. You remember, my dad told me surprising news that he wanted to get back with mom, and he needed my help, don't you? Of course, I jumped at the chance and immediately put my healing family relationships plan into action. I knew I had to somehow delay mom's wedding to Max so I pretended to break my leg. My plan was totally working, as not only did they postpone the wedding, but Max and Taylor moved out to give me time to heal. I was very satisfied, because everything was going as I planned, when suddenly, right on the day I had the bandage removed, I arrived home to hear the awful truth that shocked me to my core. My dad didn't want me to exist in the world, because I was a girl. As soul-destroying as it was, 
I continued to listen to Mum and Dad's conversation. I heard Mum say, I will never forgive you and never forget the moment you wanted me to get an abortion. Never! So don't think I will ever let you come back to this family. Dad replied, Mary, please, I beg you. I'd heard enough, so I ran into my room. It all made sense now. No wonder Dad supported my tomboy style, because he desperately wanted a boy. As for my mom, she tried to make me dress up like a girl to get revenge on him. Feeling unwanted and unloved, I packed some clothes and quietly left the house. Normally, when I was upset, I would run to my dad's, but that option was out, obviously, so where could I go? Then I thought about Harry, so I called him to pick me up, and I just told him that I felt really bad right now and wanted to run away from home. Without knowing what the exact problem was, he showed up and drove us to the beach. He bought us loads of snacks, and we sat there in silence and watched the sun go down. Then Harry turned to me and said, Are you ready to talk about it now? I sighed, ate a handful of Cheetos, then told him everything. I still can't believe it. My dad, the person I love the most, didn't want me at all. Then my mom just used me to make him suffer. Talk about exhausting. It's best if I disappear from their lives. It's not like I'm wanted here anyway. Harry listened. He looked shocked, but he didn't interrupt me. Then he patted me on the back and pulled me in for a big hug. It was weird because we never usually showed each other that kind of affection, but it didn't feel strange at all. Instead, I felt safe next to him. At this vulnerable moment, he's the only person I still trusted. After a long silence, Harry turned to me and said, Um, who said you aren't wanted? I'm happy that you were born. I mean, meeting you is the best thing that ever happened to me. I've never met someone like you before. Kat, you're a brave and an amazing girl. My heart skipped a beat, and I felt my face turn bright red. I never knew that Harry thought of me like that. Then he touched my hand and said, And there's something you should know. Um, I really... Oh my god, I didn't know why my heart was beating so fast. What's he gonna say? But then, his phone rang. It was my mum. She'd been looking for me for hours and was worried sick. When Harry told her I was with him and I was fine, she sounded so relieved. I'm not a blubber. I cried and couldn't stop. I let Harry tell her where we were. When mum arrived, she rushed over and hugged me. Why didn't you tell me you were at the beach? I was so worried. Honey, don't you ever do that to me again. I hugged her and cried so loud, I didn't really know why I cried. Maybe because it was the first time we'd ever properly hugged, and I could feel her love towards me. After we finally stopped crying, and trust me, it took a while, I told her that I knew the reason why she divorced Dad. She wiped off tears on my face and said, Oh, sweetie. I kind of guessed you must have heard us fighting earlier. I'm so sorry about that. And now you know the reason why I was always so strict on you and wanted you to dress like a girl. To show your dad how amazing it is to have a daughter. But instead, you dress and behave like a boy. Just like your father wanted. But mom, you have to understand that I dress and behave like this because it's who I am. It's not because of dad. Not because of Harry. Not because of anyone. If I change, it would mean that I don't live as my true self anymore. So, can you please let me be me, Mom? My mom smiled at me and replied, Oh, of course, sweetie. I'm so sorry. I didn't know. It was so selfish of me. I was so focused on going against your father that I forgot about your feelings. Can you ever forgive me? Of course, mom. And then we cried again. Since then, things with my mom have improved a lot, but there was still some unfinished business I had to handle. Firstly, I had to swallow my pride and apologize to Max and Taylor. Harry came with me for moral support. We all sat down and I apologized for being a childish brat. You're a good man, Max, and my mom truly loves you. I would be grateful if you and Taylor would be a part of this family. 
Can you two please come back? I said. He looked shocked for a moment, but then he smiled at me and said, With pleasure. I miss your mom so much, it's driving me crazy. Yep, he's been so miserable without her, Taylor added. I'm sorry to you too, Taylor. Do you need some help with packing? I asked her. Taylor smiled at me and replied, Sure, that'd be great. So, Mum and Max had a small ceremony in the end, although I still ended up wearing a dress, but hey, it was an exception for Mum's special day. It was a beautiful ceremony, and Mum looked amazing. Next, I had to make Taylor and Garrett get back together. I went to see Garrett at school and told him that it was all my fault Taylor broke up with him. He looked quite shocked, but at the same time, he was also happy to hear me say that. Well, that was such a relief. I felt much better now, knowing that I cleared up all misunderstandings between them. Then, when I was having lunch with Taylor in the cafeteria, he walked over with this enormous bouquet of roses, passed them to her, and asked her to be his girlfriend again. Taylor looked so surprised, but then she gave me a worried look. I smiled and said, It's okay. You two are meant for each other. She was so happy she hugged me. I guess it was good to see her happy. And last but not least, I had to finish off the beach conversation with Harry. Obviously, I couldn't let that slide that easily. I've been thinking about it a lot, wondering what could it possibly be. Was it... Does he... Jeez, why does it feel like my whole body is heating up every time I think back to that moment? I asked him to come to the beach, where I prepared a blanket on the sand with two cans of Coke and a huge pizza. His face lit up when he saw the setup. We had an awesome time and didn't stop laughing, even when Harry teased me by reminding me how I'd worn a dress to impress Garrett. I looked Harry in the eyes and said, Thanks. Thanks for always having my back when I needed. And, um, meeting you is also the greatest thing that ever happened to me. You're the only one who accepts me for who I am. He touched my hand and said, Cat. Last time, I wanted to tell you something. I... I really like you, and I want us to be more than friends. Will you be my girlfriend? Oh my god, this was crazy! Suddenly, I felt so shy, so I gently punched his arm and turned away, looking elsewhere so he couldn't see I was blushing like a tomato. Then I said, Okay, fine, but it's just because I pity you. He laughed and hugged me. It felt so good being in his arms. Life was pretty great. Finally. But there was just one last issue to resolve. My dad. I went round to his place and we had a super long talk. He admitted he messed up and apologized for what he'd done in the past and for trying to get me to split mom and Max up. He told me that it didn't matter if I was a boy or not. He will always love me and is very proud of me. So, as you can see, it's been a whirlwind, but it all worked out in the end. I have the best boyfriend ever, and an amazing family. I've been through a lot, but all I'm gonna say is, never change who you are just to fit into the norm or to please anyone. Be yourself, and the right people will love the real you. If they can't accept you for who you are, then they're just not worth it. My most precious timekeeper, there's a saying that goes, when you fully trust someone without any doubt, you'll either have a person for life or a lesson for life. You bet I learned a valuable lesson because that quote manifested itself into my life. It was the summer of 2000, before our beloved smartphones and social media even existed. Elio, Tara, and I were exploring the glorious Barcelona. Spain was our first stop on our trip across Europe to celebrate high school graduation. That's 18-year-old me. I'd always wanted a partner who I could trust with my life and stick with me through thick and thin. But the boys I dated were too childish or selfish to be considered trustworthy. Except for my sweet Elio. He's always so attentive and cared for me greatly, but somehow he couldn't ease my anxiety. 
At the beginning, I wanted us to have a couple's trip, but then I decided to have my only friend Tara join us, just to be safe. My treat, of course. Only Tara stayed friends with me after many other greedy leeches tried latching onto me for my family's wealth. Sure, I got you, girl. I was thinking you might just chicken out without me. Ha ha ha. She knew me too well. And so our journey began. Why Barcelona, you asked? Because I wanted to connect to my Spanish roots since my grandparents met then got married over there. Hopefully, Elio and I would be just like them. After weeks of sampling Michelin restaurants, five-star hotels, and high-end nightclubs, we visited Las Ramblas Market. And so did dozens of other tourists. Ugh, are they not seeing me intentionally? I can't suffocate between sweaty people, so I let us out of the crowd. Here comes fresh air. But hey, where are Tara and Elio? I reached for my phone and suddenly remembered that Elio had my handbag. My whole life's in there. My phone, my money, my passport. Ah, police! Officer! Officer, please help! I'm lost and I don't have my documents on me. But why did they keep dashing their gaze to me, then to each other? Oh, they understood me. Then they signaled me to follow them, probably to the police station. What? This is a hospital. They think I'm nuts? No, this isn't happening. What do I do? Uh, excuse me, you need help? That snapped me out of the panic attack. I turned around and saw two male supermodels. My, my. Hang on, time and place, Michaela. Turns out the guy who just approached me was Guzman. He's quite fluent in English and very friendly. Meanwhile, the cold one was Manu, who seemed to be watching me like an alien. I told him about my situation, then they led me to the U.S. Embassy. Luckily, they stayed to help me talk to the embassy staff, who I totally believe is the sloth from Zootopia in disguise. One eternity later, they said they'd help me find Elio and Tara, but it'd take several weeks. Ugh, that's it? What about me? I already told them I had neither money nor passport, right? Where do I stay? How would I survive? Right then, Guzman offered me to stay at his place and work at his family's restaurant in the meantime. Huh? Isn't that too generous to a stranger like me? These two beautiful and helpful people could be baits, but without any other option, I had to cautiously follow them. This was the first time I ever had to be on my own in a strange place, and the fact that their home was an old, slightly shabby restaurant didn't help. Mr. and Mrs. Rios, the owners, aka their parents, welcomed and fed me. I wasn't sure if the food was poisoned or not, but my rumbling tummy convinced me to blindly trust them for now. Then they showed me my room. That's nice. Perhaps a bit too nice, especially to a complete stranger. Am I going to get kidnapped like when I was five? If it wasn't for my bodyguard, I'd be living in a human trafficker's wonderland now. This room's only secured by a simple slide bolt, so I used all my strength to barricade the door <sighs> with this wardrobe. Whew, that'll do it. I couldn't sleep much and got up pretty early but it took me a while to remove my barricade and get downstairs. Ugh, scratch that. Or I might give myself scoliosis. At breakfast, they asked me how I was doing. I could only mutter a few Spanish phrases from school and prayed for my Spanish ancestors' assistance while their replies were too fast for me to comprehend. Besides, it sounded like they used a different language to communicate. Sensing my confusion, Guzman explained that people in Barcelona speak Catalan in their everyday life, not standard Spanish. Oh, right. Suddenly, I felt so alone among them. Unsurprisingly, when they opened, I was assigned dishwashing duty and organizing the storage room because I didn't speak any Catalan. Back home, I had maids and servants pick up after my every step. Literally. So working here was torture. Not to mention the hot weather here was draining me. My slow pace earned me Manu's glare, his annoyed frown, or sometimes a few words that I'm sure weren't very nice. Fortunately, Guzman was there to be the usual comic relief. I'm sorry, I don't know what I'm doing. De nada. You're doing your best, girl. Don't worry about that grumpy cat. Still, Manu was just one of my many problems. Everything seemed confusing, from how they tell the time to the metric system. Not to mention mealtimes in Spain were always somehow two hours late. I swear, I almost blacked out from hypoglycemia the first few days. But today, Manu suddenly demanded I take a table's order. Maybe they sensed my nervousness, so they pointed at the dish they wanted from the menu. Gazpacho and pesto pasta? Got it! Call me Bear Grill. Improvise, adapt, overcome is the way to go. A while later, I was just vibing in the kitchen when I heard a commotion outside. I ran out and realized the customer from before was coughing violently. What's happening to him? 
I saw Mr. Rios ran up to his date, asked a few questions, and checked his half-eaten pasta. His face suddenly turned pale, and he immediately called an ambulance. Michaela, did you, by any chance, not hear that he said he had a nut allergy? Perhaps. He told me his food should be nut-free because he's allergic, but that went over my head. Thank God the ambulance arrived on time, so he was okay. Still, Mr. Rios had to apologize, and that meal was on the house. And me? Manu gave me a piece of his mind. Why is he angry at me? He knew I didn't speak their language, yet he made me take their order. I wish I spoke Catalan so I could fire him instantly. Guess I'll have to fire him myself. Adios. I was walking around aimlessly when Manu and Guzman found me. They said they were looking for me everywhere. Manu's awkward expression was very unlike his usual cool appearance. Sorry, you not know Catalan, I not know English. We, um, misunderstand. Go home, please, o okay? Now I knew this guy seemed cold only because he didn't speak English. Seeing their sincerity, I followed them back. But will I ever return home? What if I'll never see my friends and family again for the rest of my life? The next day, I went to the U.S. Embassy and received shocking news. Elio and Tara not only had already left Barcelona, but Spain. A week ago. Why didn't you inform me immediately when you found them? Oh, we were going to do that tomorrow. They're gone anyway. <laughs> What's so funny about that, you moron? Never mind. Burning this place down wouldn't solve anything. My world had already collapsed. What did I do to deserve this? Why am I surrounded by cruel people? My paranoia was proven right once again. I can't trust anyone but myself. I relayed the news to the Rios and asked if I could live with them longer. They reassured I could stay as long as I needed. They can't reach you now either. They couldn't have abandoned you. Maybe they were looking for a way to help you. Chin up, Queen. Your tiara is gonna fall. This family's hospitality and positive energy are unmatched. Still, it saddened me that I couldn't return home just yet. A few days later, surprisingly, Manu offered me Catalan lessons. In return, I shall teach him English. He was a natural. I, on the other hand, felt like I was born with a wrong tongue. Whenever Manu got mad at me for making mistakes, I'd bombard him with questions as a distraction. Why do you use Celsius and not Fahrenheit here? Why Catalan and not Spanish? And what's up with siesta? I swear, it's like the entire city suddenly drops dead in the middle of the day. At first glance, my questions seemed to annoy Manu, but he actually answered all of them. I could see his iciness slowly melting. Time passed and my Catalan improved. Today, I even chatted with Manu's parents while working. They said this restaurant was established a few generations ago, and many troubled couples stopped by this place. But love always prevails in the end, because our food heals them all. Might sound romantic, but actually, that's because great-granddad liked being a love guru, while great-grandma wished to be a couples therapist. Since then, thanks to Manu and my co-workers, my life got a lot easier. Every time I messed up something, they'd offer help or guidance. One time, I got lost while delivering food and was gone for a long time. But when I got back, they didn't criticize me. One of them even joked that I didn't know the area because I rarely went out. So, Guzman suggested we three go to the beach after work. Some vitamin C sounds like what I need. Huh? But only Manu was waiting for me after our shift. It's uh, just us. Guzman's with his hot date. Guzman, you cheeky little schemer. Still, this isn't a date, right? Just two friends getting to know each other. I initially thought we're going to walk along La Rambla and arrive at Barceloneta Beach, but Manu took me to Playa Badalona, which was a bit further away, but pretty much empty and splendid. Strange how TripAdvisor didn't mention this place. Manu brought out a bottle of cava, a Barcelona specialty. Wow, isn't it expensive? Are you sure I can have this? You worked hard and deserve to play hard. Aw, so thoughtful. He might make me blush. Then we toasted to my chaotic arrival here. Mmm, that's the stuff. With Manu, I got to see an ordinary side of Barcelona. Not often do I get the chance to be somewhere this beautiful. I should be more adapting. Besides, if I wasn't here, I'd never get to observe this magnificent monument up close. Leave room for Jesus! Jesus! I mean, Guzman? He had a terrible date and came to vent. What were you thinking, Michaela? You have a boyfriend, remember? Eventually, my life here got more enjoyable. 
I kind of adopted the manana mentality, so taking it slow became my motto. I now realized whoever invented siesta was a genius. People would sometimes burst into songs, as others would either sing along or dance to the music. Spaniards seem to value quality of life more than those in the States. Speaking of which, I still got homesick from time to time, and Manu's the only one who seemed to notice. You can talk to me anytime. Rest assured, we're all happy to have you here. Okay, okay, I might have a teeny tiny crush on him. No, focus, Michaela. Think about Elio, your boyfriend. I wonder how he and Tara were doing. Speak of the devil, I saw them again that evening. On a TV show about tourism in Marseille, France? And they shamelessly claimed to be a couple. I couldn't believe it. However, without my passport, I couldn't get to them. So I asked Manu and Guzman to go there, and they agreed. Girl, don't worry. I'm more than happy to bring those traitors to justice on your behalf. No matter what had happened, I'll be eternally grateful to them. My guardian angels. They returned after a couple of days with my stuff. But Manu said those two show no remorse as they put all the blame on me. The moment I saw them, I knew those two were begbacking. Trust me, honey. They're penniless. But I still had questions. So I immediately called Tara and chaos ensued. Tara said my paranoia and stubbornness tired her out, as they did Elio. We kept it to ourselves all this time because we didn't want to hurt you. But actually, it felt like a relief to not have you around. Did you know that we bonded over shared trauma? That's you. Good. I hope you two are happy asking strangers for money together. Tara, are you talking to Michaela? Mickey, wait. I can't listen to another word. There wasn't even any tears left in me. Manu sat down next to me. Hey, you got rid of those traitors. Why the long face? I'm fine. Don't mind me. I just lost the only two people I trust outside my family. No biggie. Come now, it's not that bad. Give up! What the? Oh, oops, my bad. Don't give up. Uh, I mean, cheer up. <laughs> Don't laugh. I mean it. Since you got here, you've become a lot more uh, independent, haven't you? You're quite a strong, resilient girl. He's right, and not just because I like him. I'd been so caught up in everything that I didn't realize I'd been entrusting my life to him, who I barely knew. I'd been relying so much on him and his family. Maybe it's not so bad knowing good people still exist. And this guy, he makes it so hard for me to leave his place. At the crack of dawn, I woke up to the deafening sound of helicopters? That's my family crest. My parents must have sent those choppers. A swole guy in black came up to me and said my dad wanted me home because I'd gone AWOL for far too long. Then he just grabbed me and we flew straight back to America. I begged him to turn around so I could say goodbye to Manu, Guzman, Mr. and Mrs. Rios, my saviors. But my pleading was completely ignored. I was finally home and went to college, but as a different person, I was determined to socialize more and befriend new people. And no, it's not just talks. I actually moved into the dorm to be surrounded by my peers. It's been a long time coming, but I learned to open up and keep my trust issue in check. I shouldn't pass up on companionship out of irrational fears. However, I couldn't take my mind off Manu. We didn't even properly say goodbye and had no way to contact one another. So I went back to Barcelona to look for him. But when I got there, his family said he'd just gone to the airport. Turns out, he went looking for me, too. I immediately got in a taxi and headed to the airport. As soon as I arrived, I saw the earliest flight to America had already taken off. That's how my time abroad wrapped up. Michaela, mi amor, where are you? Yes, my love. That photo album again. I'm right here. Eyes on me. Well, I couldn't figure out why you didn't board that flight. I just had a feeling that I'd see you again if I turned around. Call it telepathy. That's my dad, Marcus Baldwin, the world-famous jockey. Now he's the chairman of a super successful horse racing club. As his cherished only child, I was given everything I could ever dream of. But then something big happened that changed things. Before I tell you more, don't forget to like and subscribe. At the age of eight, I was in the playroom brushing my doll's hair when dad let this tatty looking woman and her daughter in. Audrey, I'd like you to meet Belinda and her mom. They're going to be staying here for a while and be our new mates. Belinda looked so frightened. So feeling bad for her, I took her hand and let her play with my dolls. We soon became the best of friends and I even managed to persuade dad to let her attend the same school as me. 
Unsurprisingly, I grew up obsessed with horses and dreamed of becoming a famous jockey like Dad. I practiced riding my horse, Jackal, every day after school, and we became quite the formidable team. Soon, I was winning a heap of junior contests, and even the newspapers predicted I'd be the next big name in the world of horse racing. This certainly helped my popularity at school, and I began a clique full of elite members. However, there was one slight problem. Due to Belinda's humble background, the other girls didn't get with her. Where did you get those shoes from? Your grandma? Did you let your grandma style your hair too? Come on, girls. Let's see if the canteen has any oat muffins left. Everything was practically perfect, and to put the cherry on top of the cake, I was invited to a gala event for talented young jockeys. I needed to look the part, so I got my driver to take me to the mall to find the most amazing outfit. But on the way, everything changed. I woke up in the hospital, wearing an ugly gown and feeling dizzy with confusion. Oh my, you're awake! Huh? Why am I here? Sweetie, you were in a car accident. You've been in a coma for the last two years. Two years? W what? No way! That meant I'd missed out on two whole years of my life and was now 17! I missed my own sweet 16! Once I got over the initial shock of being Sleeping Beauty, I made sure to ask the most important question. Is Jackal okay? Who won the Grand Youth Championship? After catching up with my parents, they told me something even more surprising. Audrey, you've been very poorly, and we thought we were going to lose you. You needed a new kidney, but we weren't matches. But Belinda was, and she donated you hers. We are so grateful to her that when her mom sadly passed away, we decided to adopt her. She's now your sister. I was sad to hear about Belinda's mom, but grateful for what Belinda did for me. I'd always seen her as my sister anyway. Right after I got discharged from the hospital, I was excited to get back to school and resume my life. Only, it seemed the world had moved on without me. No one dressed like me anymore, and I was stuck in a class with 15-year-olds. I tried to interact with them, so when I saw the teacher pinning up a picture of an elderly man, I asked if this was her grandpa. The whole class fell silent for a second, then suddenly exploded with laughter. It's the president, Audrey. Ugh, how was I supposed to know? At lunchtime, when I went to join my old friends, I overheard them talking. 2021 called, it wants its tennis skirt back. Hmm? What language is she speaking? Oh my god, Audrey is like an alien. She doesn't know anything. I mentioned the lucky girl syndrome trend, and she literally looked at me like a fish. Come on now, you know she can't help it. Let's go get some cheese fries. Anything you say, Belinda. <laughs> Belinda was on my side, right? Hmm, it kind of felt like she'd stepped right in and taken my place. At least my parents would be glad to have me home, right? Wrong. Mom was always shopping, attending yoga class and the spa, but she didn't ask me to go with her. Instead, she always asked Belinda. It felt like she'd forgotten that me, her real daughter, actually existed. Meanwhile, at the riding club, as I traipsed through the stables, I heard Dad talking to Belinda about an upcoming event. I'm so lucky you're here to help promote this event. I'd be lost without you. I no longer fit in at school, at home, or at the horse racing club. Life has changed around me, and I felt frozen in time. <sighs> Worse still, I had to take this gross medicine. One time my maid was chasing me around the furniture trying to make me take it, but I used ornaments, cushions, and books to block the path. I was so distracted making my obstacle course that I bumped straight into Douglas Barron, my dad's business partner. My, my. You certainly are a determined young lady. Later that evening, Dad called me into his office. I thought he was going to grumble at me for not taking my meds, but instead he said something I wasn't expecting. It seems that Douglas is rather impressed by you. He wants you to date his son, Damien. The firm's been under a lot of pressure recently, and having Douglas on side would be beneficial, especially as he's our biggest stakeholder. What? You want me to date a stranger just to help your business? I can revive the business myself without having to do that. I just need to win the horse racing tournament. No, it's too soon after the coma. You're not ready yet. Dating is the only way. Pfft. As if I was going to listen to dad. So I secretly came here with Belinda. I was about to saddle up Jackal, but then I got a whiff of horse manure and began to feel dizzy and nauseous. Dad suddenly showed up and took me to the hospital. Turns out, I'm allergic to horse manure. Ugh. Then Dad started yelling at me for training without his permission. Thankfully, Belinda informed me what was going on and told me about your allergy. Belinda? Why? Sorry, sis. I only told Dad as I'm worried about you. Whatever. I'm still going to horse race again. Actually, there's physical therapy, and if you pass the agility test, you could still get back to training. Dad, please. Fine. Do the therapy, but only if you go on this date with Damien. I agreed to go on the date, 
but I never said anything about being well-behaved on it. <laughs> so in order to prepare for our special date, I watched this tutorial video, How to Dress to Attract Men, a tutorial. Rule number one, make sure your hair is long and never put up. Rule number two, make sure to show a little skin, ladies. Rule number three, footwear should be dainty and delicate. And ta-da! As I showed up at the restaurant looking ridiculous, I instantly recognized this quirky guy from school, Damien. So I made sure I had the most unapproachable expression on my face. As soon as I sat down, I purposely ordered the weirdest food combo, ice cream hamburger. <laughs> I was convinced he'd think I was a lunatic and leave, but instead, he reached over and tried a bite of my ice cream burger. Hmm, interesting. What? How could he like that? Someone please call the food police over here. Your fashion sense is so refreshing. Everything about you is fascinating. I am rather smitten. The rumors about him being quirky are definitely true. After the disastrous date with Damien, I met with Cooper, a medical student at the hospital who was helping me with my physical therapy. During the training, he was attentive and super encouraging. I was beginning to feel better, but then Damien showed up and insisted on staying there so he could check Cooper was doing his job properly. He wouldn't stop humming annoying tunes and munching on potato chips really loudly. Then at home afterward, he wouldn't leave and continued bugging me. When he finally left, I moaned to Belinda about how annoying he was. But to my surprise, she said she thought he was cute and funny? Hang on, does this mean Belinda likes Damien? On the day of the physical examination, I passed every single test without any mistakes. I was smiling as the doctor made his announcement. Miss Baldwin, I'm afraid you failed the assessment. I ran out of there and cried to myself. I felt someone sit next to me and was about to tell them to go away when I realized it was Cooper. Audrey, the improvements you've made are impressive. I was sure you'd pass. Seeing his caring face made me feel a little better. We talked some more and then he offered to drive me home. As we walked around the corner to the parking lot, we heard Belinda raising her voice with, The doctor! We stopped to listen. I'm not giving you more money! I already paid you for failing Audrey! Sign this so I can be sure you'll keep this a secret! What? How could Belinda betray me like this? Belinda, why? Why did you do this? You don't understand how hard it is living in your shadow. I love the horse riding club, but you're coming back and there will be no use for me there anymore. You ruined everything! Then she stormed off, leaving me standing there stunned. I immediately got home and told dad what she'd done. I expected him to be on my side, but... I'm sure you're overthinking the situation. Besides, you should be grateful to Belinda. Not only did she save your life, but now she has agreed to marry Damien to save the company. Ugh! Belinda was only doing this to steal my life! It wouldn't work. I was more determined than ever to go back into horse riding and claim back my life. Mine! Meanwhile, Cooper helped find another doctor to test me, and this time I passed. I showed my results to dad, and he finally allowed me to go back to training. But when I brought up Belinda bribing the doctor again, he just remained quiet. Am I even his daughter anymore? Okay, change of plan then. I met up with Damien to ask about his marriage with Belinda. So, did you agree to the marriage? No way! I don't want to marry whatever her name is. Great! I mean, that's sad. Well, my heart belongs to you. Hmm, how about we get payback on them and fake date? Just faking it though, if you don't mind. Fake? Real? If it means being your boyfriend, then I'll do it! So we immediately returned home, walked inside and linked to arms and gave each other a lovey-dovey looks. Belinda's scrunched up face was a picture. I resumed horse riding practice and got around my allergy problems by using sachets and spraying perfume all over myself. It worked at first, but then I started getting allergic to the sachets too. Cooper immediately took notice and the next day he showed up with some homemade herbal sachets. Not only did they help cure my allergy, but they also had a calming effect on me. Without the allergy bothering me, I could focus on practicing. And soon I was back to my amazing former riding self again. I showcased my talents to the club and everyone seemed impressed. A talent like you should be head of the club. Yeah, I may not be a big talker like someone I know, but actions speak louder than words. Belinda was clearly jealous of my rise to success, so she pulled some mean pranks on me at school. One time she suddenly turned nice and offered me a coffee, but it turned out she had snuck hot sauce in it. I was so mad. I changed her ringtone to fart sounds and called her number. It was hilarious. <laughs> But then she suddenly fainted and was taken to the school infirmary. Oh, come on. She was so hurt she fainted. I told the other students she was faking it. But instead of listening to me, they all took Belinda's side. You're so ungrateful. Belinda even gave you her kidney, yet you scared her so much she fainted? 
Yeah, you wouldn't be here today without her. What kind of person are you? Feeling deflated and not listened to, I ran off. I stormed home, and on the way, bumped into Cooper. Unable to hold my emotions anymore, I burst into tears. He insisted we went for a walk, and I ended up spilling out everything to him. Hmm, I don't condone what Belinda did, but I kinda see it from her perspective. She's an orphan who longs for a family. She finally found her place in the world, and then you woke up and became a threat. I never thought of it like that before. I realized the best thing I could do was to stop the pointless revenge and put all my energy into my recovery. I stopped hanging around with my clique, then broke up with Damien. I trained hard at the club, but not for my dad or the company, but for myself. Belinda showed up and tried provoking me, but I just ignored her. All my hard work paid off, and I qualified for the tournament. At the tournament, I was leading the race and felt unstoppable. But then some bee started buzzing around Jackal's face. He freaked out and started bucking. Then everything went dark. I woke up in the hospital feeling drowsy and saw someone rummaging in my bed. Belinda, what are you doing? Then Cooper appeared. Is this what you're after? I saw Belinda swap the sachets for pollen ones to attract the bees. I bet she also switched the ones before to worsen your allergies. What did I do to deserve this? It's so easy for you, isn't it? Because of you, I've lost everything! Belinda, how could you? Apologize to Audrey right now! No, I won't! This is all your fault! It's all my fault. Many years ago, I was in a relationship with Belinda's mom. We ended on amicable terms, but it was only in her final days that she told me the truth. Belinda is my daughter. I didn't want to upset anyone, so I kept it to myself. But then when you needed a kidney and Belinda ended up being a match, I used this as a reason to suggest adopting her. Then you woke up and we were so happy. I didn't realize how this had affected Belinda or you, Audrey. Please forgive me. I want to put it right. Mom and me were so shocked and Mom told him to go and find Belinda. After Dad left, Mom hugged me. Sweetie, both you and Belinda deserve warmth and love. I promise things will be better from now on. As I left the hospital the next day, I saw Belinda walking toward me. I'm so sorry. You've been nothing but good to me, and I was horrible. I was so worried about you when you were in the coma. But when you woke up, I got scared no one would want me anymore. I care about you, Audrey. You're my sister. I wrapped my arms around her. You've always been a sister to me, Belinda. But please, no more pranks. Then I saw Cooper walking over to me, holding a huge balloon. Looks like you have company. I'm glad you both made up. Here, I got you this. Hi there, I'm Maxine Coleman. I'm the only daughter of two world-famous rocket scientists. Since I was little, I was brought along each time they made a television appearance. And my plus one was always my best friend, Gail. What's your secret to such success? Well, we've both loved science since we were kids and decided to devote our lives to it. And family is our biggest motivation. It's not rocket science. Whoa, your parents are so cool. On our way home, Dad asked me, So, what's your dream, sweetie? While I was scratching my head for an answer, Gail already said, uh, I want to be a talk show host, just like the, that lady tonight. That's great. You can definitely do it. Don't worry, Maxine. You'll soon know yours. However, both Gail and I had problems learning. While Gail struggled to say a proper sentence, reading and writing gave me the hardest time. Naturally, we both hated school. My parents took me to the doctor, and I was diagnosed with dyslexia. He also said I'd have much difficulty in school and wouldn't achieve high academic results. I was quite upset to hear that, but my pop-pop, who was a high school teacher, wasn't pleased with that remark. Nonsense. Maxine's very bright. Dyslexic or not, she'll succeed with the right method. Since then, Pop-Pop began helping me and Gail study. Each time we finished a book, he'd give us little rewards. He also introduced us to sports, and even brought us to cool places like museums, galleries, and aquariums. From the moment I stepped foot in the aquarium, I knew this place is right up my alley because... Dolphins! Look, it's following me! I immediately told my parents the good news that evening. I found my passion. I'll become a marine biologist when I grow up. Years went by, and school wasn't scary to us anymore. Thanks to my pop-pop, I'm now at the top of my class and excel at biology. Dyslexia didn't have much effect on me. Meanwhile, Gail got rid of her stutter and became much more confident. We're like Superman and Batman, always side by side, working towards our own dream. Professor Coleman, please tell us more about your latest research on marine life. Ahem, this is my life's work, which has been under development for the last decade. We both got into an elite high school, which would be a good jumping pad for our future. 
But unlike in middle school where I could learn at my own pace, I had to bend over backwards to have a good GPA since the curriculum here is so intense. Unfortunately, dyslexia returned due to stress, making things even harder for me. In class, I had to look up the dictionary every five minutes, which slowed me down. One time, I stayed in class during recess to correct all the D's and B's that I'd mixed up in my essay. That alone got me called nerd. On the contrary, the pretty, extroverted Gail already became the face of the student's council, and she still tried her best to help me. That's right, this is just a minor setback. But that's not all. Yesterday, my chemistry teacher asked me to read the lab safety rules. Don't taste or sniff. You should be wafting the spell. What? I mean, smell. Sorry. We're in chemistry class, not potions 101, Professor Snape. That's how Snape became my nickname. All because of that Robbie guy. Everyone loved his shenanigans, and he got away with everything because he's a rising track star. But really, he's the villain in my story. Lately, Gail and I had less time to chat because she's so busy. Hanging out with Robbie. They met when Gail interviewed him for the school paper. Worse still, she often defended him, saying I'd like him once I got to know the guy. Ugh, no thanks. Besides, it seems that Gail's making achievements towards her dream. Meanwhile, I could barely handle studying and getting along with my classmates. Then came a time when every student who wished for a head start into a prestigious university needed to see the college counselor, Mrs. Morales. She said that my grades were pretty good, but I'd also need a good personal statement. It's supposed to capture the essence of who I am and show that I'm ready to commit myself to my future. Simple enough, right? But when it comes to actually writing, why is it so hard? Am I doubting my own plan? Can I really be a marine biologist? At dinner, I tried to bring this up to my parents, but it seemed they're already thinking I'm a marine bio student. Guess there's no turning back now. I called Gail to the aquarium to help me clear my thoughts. She was late, so I went to catch up with my dolphin friends. They actually calmed me down. Suddenly, a screeching voice took me out. You're dyslexic because you speak dolphins language? <gasps> Should we find Dolphinese books for you? I turned around to see Gail in an entourage of her new friends and that buffoon. They started giggling. No word in the English language could describe how mad and humiliated I was. Did you really need to bring them here just to embarrass me? I walked away, but accidentally headed to a glass tunnel. It felt like I was fully submerged underwater. The horrible memory of the time I fell through ice into the deep, dark, frozen cold water came rushing back. I immediately dashed outside. Max, wait! I turned around to see Gail running after me. Watch out! A car's coming! I quickly pushed her away. The car didn't hit her, but she's injured. We brought her to the hospital ASAP. But when she came to, Gail couldn't speak. Her doctor said her vocal cord was temporarily paralyzed due to neck and chest trauma. That meant Gail could no longer present the school sports day. I was overcome with guilt. Gail told me, I'll be alright. Sorry about earlier. I thought bringing our classmates would cheer you up. She even said that I should keep chasing my dream and not let anything hold me back. I was so touched. But somehow, her words made me feel so pressured. I'll even work harder from now on. After that day, Robbie kept following me around trying to apologize. I avoided him like the plague. One day, I even skipped English and when I got back, my classmates were buzzing about some substitute teacher named Mr. Coleman. They seemed so excited, since he didn't make them do any work and only told them fun anecdotes. Huh? That name rings a bell. And later my suspicion was confirmed, when I met with my grandpa's angry and disappointed look after school. I obviously went home to a raging storm, but it didn't matter. I used this chance to spill my guts about how exhausting school was, how annoying it was to be picked on by an absolute moron, all the time while my bestie wasn't by my side. Strangely, Grandpa listened attentively, then simply said he'd handle it. A few days later, he revealed that his way of handling it was making me that dimwit's tutor. Worst idea ever! Even though Pop Pop guaranteed that clown would work with me, I still wanted to kiss that jock with an uppercut. I ranted to Gail, thinking she'd help me out of this. Unexpectedly, Gail also told me to give him a chance. Then, I might see his good side too? Right at that moment, the idiot appeared with a Nintendo Switch. How immature! That's my cue to leave. After the first lesson, I realized any regular teaching method could never hold this dummy's attention. But I can't just give up. Pop Pop taught me that there's no bad students. Fine, I'll find the right way to make him study. So, I showed him YouTube videos on biology to keep him focused, taught him the periodic table song, and talked about world history in his language. 
In 1914, after the Austrian Archduke was unrelieved, Australia-Hungary declared war on Serbia, and Russia was like, say less, we got you, bro. Then Germany wanted to be the main character and waged war when literally nobody asked. So, you're saying World War I started mostly because the German Empire was pressed about being mid? Yes, brother. After some time, Robbie's grades went from D and F to C and B, while I no longer had to cram like before, since preparing lessons for him helped me remember everything naturally. Studying suddenly wasn't so hard anymore. And maybe Gail was right. This guy wasn't that terrible after all. One afternoon, Robbie shared some good news. Hey, my track meet went so well. Thanks for helping me with my grades, or else I would have been disqualified. Let's celebrate! Congrats! Can't celebrate without Gail. I heard she just got back from the hospital. Let's come to her place and get nuts! Moderately, though. Robbie passionately talked about his great achievement, while I told Gail that we're getting along now, but Gail seemed unenthusiastic. Then she coldly asked us to leave. We were both so confused. I asked Gail's mum and found out that most of her injuries had healed, except for her vocal cord. She's undergoing treatment, but her doctor was unsure how long it would take for her to talk again. Poor girl. Suddenly, Gail rushed out to put a piece of paper in my hand, then ran away. On my way home, I read the note. It's all your fault. If you didn't run, none of this would have happened. I'd rather get hit by a car. It would have only given me a broken arm. It's you who killed my dream. That's Gail's true feelings? Her words cut deep. When Gail returned to class, she didn't talk to anyone, and of course avoided me and Robbie. One time during recess, Mrs. Morales came to me and complimented my personal statement. She even said that if I kept up my GPA, I should have it all in my bag. That means my essay didn't seem as pretentious as I thought, right? Robbie was so happy for me, but I saw Gail's glare out of the corner of my eye and immediately signaled for Robbie to keep it down. At lunchtime, he asked if I was upset because of Gail. Not really. She'll perk up when she gets better. So, why the long face? Did Mrs. Morales say you have a bright future ahead of you? I'm not sure anymore. I made myself out to look like someone fully committed to marine biology in my essay, but deep down, it felt like I was lying. I can't even get close to water after... after falling through the ice that one time. I suddenly felt my throat closing and my eyes watering. I instinctively stood up and left without saying another word. I wanted to talk to my mother about this as soon as I got home, but I arrived in the middle of her conversation with Gail's mom. She brought us the good news. Voice therapy worked, and Gail could talk now. That's amazing. Gail's mom said she's waiting for me at the park, so I went straight there. At the park, I saw Gail standing by a pond. Thank goodness you can talk again. I always knew you'd recover for your dream. My dream? Tsk, it's turned to ashes. Then Gail told me that although she could talk again, her buttery smooth voice didn't return. Oh no, I was dead inside and tried my best to comfort her. I still believed she could overcome this and regain her voice, the same way she got over her stutter. Easy for you to say. Do you know what it's like to have a demon in your throat? I don't even recognize myself anymore. No, no, you can still- How about you? Can you get over your fear to achieve your dream? Come on now, do it! With each line, Gail put another step forward, pushing me closer to the edge, until there was only a few inches between me and the water. Go on, it's for your dream. What are you afraid of? Gail took one more step, and I fell into the pond. My trauma took over me. I panicked, thinking this was it. Then someone pulled me out. Robbie! You're insane! She could have died! Gail just ran away crying. <laughs> Don't yell at her. I shouldn't have picked at her wound. Also, this should be a practice for when I become a marine biologist. Seriously? Or are you just scaring yourself even more? My family expects this much from me. If I gave up on my dream because of a tiny little accident from when I was 13, I only have myself to blame. Dream this, dream that. Are you sure that's what you really want to do, and not just a six-year-old girl's dream? Robbie's words jolted me awake. It's true that I no longer enjoy studying as much as when I was learning with Pop Pop. Every ounce of effort I put out recently was solely for a far-fetched dream that I'm not even sure if I want anymore. I don't want to disappoint my parents, but I can't keep struggling like this for the rest of my life. But I've held on to this dream for so long and worked so hard for it. What do I do if I give up now? You'll figure it out. Take your time. I used to play football and was sure that I'd become an NFL player. Then at one point I realized that's not my thing, so I quit. And after trying out many different things, I fell in love with track. Change isn't the end of the world. I can't believe it took me this long to realize that it's too early for me to commit. Change is normal. 
But what if I never find my life's ultimate goal? And I'm just wasting time. Jeez, chill, man. You're making someone like me, who couldn't care less about school, actually enjoy studying. You're living life and putting some good into the world. Ain't no time wasted. No need to be Martin Scorsese. <laughs> you mean marine biologist, right? <laughs> uh, but thank you. I needed that. I came home to see Gail crying to my very concerned parents. Mom jumped to embrace me when she saw that I was drenched. Gail told me everything. Why didn't you tell us? We're so proud of you, and nothing would ever stop us. So, Gail revealed my fear of water from that accident when I was 13, and how much I tried to overcome that fear from my childhood dream. It's so difficult for me to talk about it, mostly because I can't admit to myself that accident left a scar on me, so I'd suppressed my pain all this time. Telling both my parents about it now actually felt liberating. Luckily, they're very understanding and allowed me time to find my true calling. As for Gail, I'm sorry. I was so frustrated with myself that I put it all on you. It's not your fault. Turned out, when Gail ran off, she was hiding behind a bush nearby and overheard my conversation with Robbie. His surprisingly wise take moved her as well. Gail said she'd keep doing therapy for as long as it'd take. Yes, I believe in you. If voice therapy doesn't work out, becoming a heavy metal rock star doesn't sound too bad. <laughs> wow, really? I thought Robbie was talking for a second there. After that, it was business as usual, but there's less pressure on me. I actually made a new friend this year and got closer to my best friend. Gail's voice is improving, and she's also having fun exploring other avenues besides talk show host now. Summer came in the blink of an eye, and I decided to volunteer at a school for students with learning disabilities. I wanted to help other dyslexic people like me learn to the best of their ability, the same way Pop Pop helped me. It sounds like a good start for my own self-discovery journey. That could be my dream job. If it's not, I'll keep looking.